2005, I was uh, given a Arts Council, NASA, Leonardo Network fellowship, it's an international fellowship, to become the artist, first artist in residence at the Space Sciences Laboratory in Berkeley at the University of California. And uh, I spent three months there, and during those three months, developed three projects, one of which is the film that I'm going to show today. Uh, that film is the outcome of talking to probably around 35 to 40 scientists and um, over a period of three months and videoing some of them and then filtering down uh, through uh, deciding that 12 of those scientists somehow there was a kind of interrelationship between them that interested me and it was basically about the transformation of energy from one state to another. Uh, the first, well, the thing is I started working on three projects at the same time. One was the film, uh, the other was this particular project which was working with Aerogel. Uh, I came across Aerogel in one of my uh, discussions uh, with Andrew Westfall, who was the deputy director of the lab and who was working on the Stardust at Home project. Basically that was uh, a project in which uh, a group of scientists in NASA were collecting interstellar dust, some of which was uh, co cometary dust and uh, the more difficult and rarer particles were, came from outside our solar system, so uh, what we call stardust. And um, I was very interested in aerogel as a material uh, because it, it has this extraordinarily um, unearthly uh, uh, appearance. It's silicon dioxide in the state that I worked with it, although uh, Stephen Jones, the chemist who fabricates it for NASA, uh, makes it many different uh, chemical uh, combinations. And so some of the some of bits I used also had iron oxide in, and you'll see that. Um, this particular piece was called uh, Heavenly Fragments, and as you can see, it is uh, made out of fragments. Why? Because um, when Stephen would send me pieces, very often, I'd say about 70% of the time, they would be broken. Uh, so this piece was made out of a, a, a disc and a cone. Um, I, the way I worked with it was to uh, project travel video onto the fragments or the whole pieces of air gel. Uh, the reason for this was that the scientists were receiving information from outer space uh, and I wanted to, and, and that information was actually bombarded into the air gel and as it hit the air gel it created a conical hole. Um, so I thought I would make cones, solid cones, out of aerogel. And then eventually I, I came to this idea of using information from the Earth. So what information could I get from the Earth? I could get all the information that I get when I travel around and video various places on our planet. And so I projected these videos onto four, actually four different installations uh, using air gel. And I called all of these installations Stardust Ruins. Uh, this one is called Burma Requiem. And the reason for that is that it's, it was a ring um, of air gel, and it came to me in three separate uh, pieces, so it's broken. So it's a broken ring, and a broken ring for me symbolizes uh, a, a broken, a, a unity that has fragmented, that has disconnected. Uh, and Burma is definitely a, 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 dis, a broken culture, a broken society that, um, it's a very tragic 
place. And I have been there and I have filmed there. And so uh, I projected the footage of that onto the air gel. Now the interesting thing about air gel is the way it reacts to light. And at least that was the interesting thing for me. Uh, the, what it does is it, because it's a web, a very, very fine web, a microscopic web, uh, and, and, and emptiness, uh, the, the imagery, the light, can only reflect off the web. So the information that we get from the surface of the aerogel fragments is, if you like, discontinuous. And we cannot make out the customary images of reality that we're so used to. The interesting thing about that is that when you're a very small child, you do not see the world the way we see it as adults. Uh, a very small child sees the world as a, a continual flux of color and form, uh, blurred in a sense. Not blurred by, because the child can't see, but, but if you like, m melded, merged, because a child doesn't distinguish. So, uh, and, and has to learn. The brain actually has to adapt to separate objects to find out what the difference is between subject and object, to learn that. So I, I found that very interesting when I read about it, and I thought, in a sense, I like to go back to that, to be able to see the flux, to see the world around me as a continuous flow uh, instead of separate entities. And so that's what uh, these pieces are about or at least on one level, what they're about. Um, and this is another one, which is called Ruins of Cash. Uh, I made them in 2008. And the, all three pieces were installed at, uh, in a show I had at Rifle Maker in London. And this one, Ruins of Cash, is based on the idea of, again, of ruins, and a book by Roberto Colasso called The Ruin of Cash which is a book about sacrifice and uh, the, the beginning of literature, the beginning of storytelling. So as you can see, my work is on a lot of levels, and I'm not going to tell you all that much in half an hour. But we've, I'm going to take you from the work that I did at, um, at SSL, Space Science Laboratory, back to 1959, a very early drawing, and what you see is two geometrical shapes, a circle and a triangle. And the circle is, if you like, full, pollulating, um, with a strange mass of squirming figures or images. Uh, I don't even know what they are anymore. Um, but basically, they're the, uh, they come from the unconscious. So I think of it as vision. It's a visionary image. Uh, in the middle, there's an empty triangle. So to me, that really is a, 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 an image of the unconscious and the con and conscious mind. And the conscious mind being empty and the unconscious being full. Uh, it, it, that, that's simply the way I interpret it with hindsight. Uh, but it, it, it's a kind of key drawing and uh, I think it'll take us through a number of slides, which I'm going to go through quite quickly. Uh, liquid reflections, which I began eight years later. Well, I didn't begin eight years later. It's a work that took about four or five years to develop. And it started off with my interest in reflections and light. Uh, and also my interest in astronomy and physics, um, which didn't come from education, as I had very little edu scientific education. Uh, it came from reading and observing. So uh, going to the Science Museum, reading scientific uh, magazines and books, and just observing nature and observing phenomena and, and, and the way things work. Um, basically, I was interested in light and reflections. and. In these pieces, I have developed uh, lenticular reflections 
into a more living uh, state where the reflections were made by um, the, these little uh, dewdrop-like lenses, if you like, which are con condensation of the water inside this perspex disc. The perspex disc then revolves. The water moves around, so you get tidal, tidal movements inside the disc. And you can observe all that in the actual uh, reflections and shadows on the on this back surface of the disc. However, by putting two uh, spheres, perspex spheres, on the surface of the disc, uh, the, the movement of the spheres, then they act as magnifying lenses. And so you get this moving, this moving cosmology, if you like, uh, of what is inside the disc. Um, uh, think about how that relates to the drawing, and um, we'll move forward. I mean, I, it's going to be very difficult for me to talk in detail about the work, and so I've decided to give you a little overview. Um, and these works rotate, and because they rotate, the balls move at random on their surface. Uh, but of course, the first thing balls will do is fall off the surface because of centrifugal forces. And so I have to counter that with a, a centripetal, centripetal force, which I did by di dishing the disc, if you like. And so you've got this constant uh, play of forces between the balls wanting to move outward and inward. And uh, there are other complexities, like the, the tidal motion of the actual water inside creates different angular momentum, different weights that tilt the disc very, very slightly, very, very little. But every single change changes the way the balls move. And this was at the Mead Gallery when I had a retrospective <coughs> in 2005, uh, a partial retrospective up to 1980. And here was a, a, an installation of five of these. And Basically, there, there's a kind of outer space feeling because they are like models of, of, of astronomical models, if you like, models of physics, of the forces that occur um, naturally between uh, planets, uh, astronomical bodies. So from this, uh, I'm jumping. That's why it's called future time, because we're going to go back and forward in time from the, from the past to the future to the present, just moving around. Um, this is a work, um, I'm going to let you read that. Basically, this is a work I call Moon Meme. And uh, the work, as you can see, is, a, is an homage to the feminine principle of transformation and renewal. Um, what I, the idea I first had was to project an, a one word onto the surface of the moon, la, large enough so that it could be seen from Earth. And that word would be changed, transformed, by the movements of the moon, the Earth, and the sun. So you would begin to see the word E, and then he, and then finally, she, as the lunar cycle progressed. And it would become obvious that the opposites were actually not opposites, but entwined with each other in this dance of change that we call time. This project uh, was very difficult to do, very, very costly and had quite a bit of opposition as well for various reasons. Uh, and so actual projection on the moon seemed out of the question for the time being. And so I, I, I thought of doing it virtually and uh, with the help of an astronomer uh, and uh, various um, enge astronomical engineers, uh, we did um, it so that it could be seen online and it's on my website, thanks to Richard Wiley. Um, but uh, coming back to that, I'm hoping to do it as a very, very large project uh, in the near future. Um, 
again, not on the moon, on Earth. Um, now, as you can see, moon mean involves text. And so I'm taking you back again into time, into 19, early 1960s, when I began working with text, which I collaborated with poets such as Nasli Noor, uh, Sinclair Bayless, various poets I knew at the time in Paris, and um, put their words, cut up their words, because I couldn't use the whole poem, but and put various words on, or, or fragments of poems, onto drums, which then spun. And the idea was to give energy back to language. So here you can see it spinning. And you'll see this later in motion in the film. And um, again, there's, there are astronomical references that which constantly go through my work, as well as references that I would say relate to uh, Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, which I feel there's the, always been this connection, as far as I'm concerned, between an, a kind an understanding of um, the cosmos, the way things work, um, if you like, science, and this particular philosophy developed in India and China. Uh, this piece, which again came from a poem of Nazli Noor's but was somewhat altered by myself, is um, takes Einstein's formula and plays with it in the context, again, of a, of a Buddhist thought, of a Buddhist way of looking at the world. Um, it also cubes the speed of light, which um, a Portuguese cosmologist recently saw and said, oh, you understand the way we think. And I said, yes, um, I made it in 1968. So you see, time isn't linear, and thought is definitely not linear. Um, and this piece, Apollinaire, again, this is in the context of the Mead exhibition, um, was about Apollinaire, but using a number system <coughs> to break down the words and relate each word to a number. Uh, so I used his name, Apollinaire, and broke, fragmented down the name into different words like pollen and air and then float and from that sky. And each number related to, no, uh, sorry, each word related to numbers, simply by numbering the alphabet and then adding up numbers, adding up letters to form key numbers for each word. So all these are in motion. Now, I, I worked with text and I worked with text that becomes lines or vibrations. And I thought, well, text, these, these, these vibrations, which are words, potentially, or meaning, can be broken down and taken back to the line. So in doing that, I made these cones that I um, took apart. I cut apart into elliptical sections and then laminated with perspex planes, and put them together again, put light inside them and had them spin. And what happens is that you begin to see the cone uh, in, as a relationship between its parts. And, and that's something that's been quite important in my work, the idea that a thing is not a thing, it's a set of relations, it's a set of, so it's looking at an object as a, a, again, something that is continually in flux. So you see it in different contexts. This was made in 2004, the other one in 69. So they change proportions, they change scale, uh, but the, the, the meaning, the content behind them is the same. And I'm constantly trying to figure out new ways of doing these. So this was done with fiber optics. Uh, or I've done it with neon, and I've done it with the, because of, because of the diff technical, the actual technical difficulty of actually making these pieces, which is very difficult. In 1970, 
I thought of using, again, the conical shape, but of using it to, um, as, a, as a, an energy, uh, a source of energy, a creator of energy. And, and I thought of making a, a wind turbine, but having it conical with the, the veins actually being conical. And I also thought that this wind turbine could possibly um, give a small town not only electricity, but music. Um, this, this was shown in Milan, and then the, um, the organizer of the show tried to, he took the, the drawings to Japan and tried to get people interested in actually creating these wind turbines, but it didn't happen for some reason. Um, and this is that, th these pieces are exhibited also at the Hatton Gallery. Now, in, in 82, so 12 years later, I was asked to do a large sculpture for the um, Birchwood Science Park in Warrington. And um, basically, this is um, British Nuclear Fuels and Nuclear Energy Research Center. And I thought it would be interesting to show them an alternative. And so I wanted to do my whirling wind tower um, and to create energy, again, using wind. And they, they, did, they weren't too happy about that because their budget wouldn't have stretched to incorporate movement in the sculpture, which is always much more expensive, particularly on a large scale. Um, and so what I decided to do was to create a reference, a sculpture that re referenced wind by taking on the form of parabolic sails. And, um, but at the same time, uh, also was a sculpture that spoke about the nature of things as being, uh, what is reality? I mean, that was the question it's asking, what is reality? And the answer here is reality is a set of interference patterns. In other words, it's the way things interfere with each other. It's, it is, again, about relation. So this big sculpture, which is 40 foot high, is in fact uh, made out of stainless steel. And yet, um, when the sun is behind it, it's transparent and looks like glass. And when the sun hits it, it's opaque and looks like steel. And the whole thing is pulsating with energy due to the interference of one vein with another. Now I'm taking you quite quickly through to another area that I work with, which are glass prisms. Um, and um, again, you can see that all of my work has, a con has an interest in geometry. So I'm using very basic geometric forms most of the time. Um, and here I'm using the prism, which is, uh, a, if you like, a three-dimensional triangle, or uh, the growth of triangles into three-dimensional forms. But it's also an instrument. And these prisms are basically tank prisms. So they come out of war machinery. In fact, these prisms come out of Second World War tanks. Um, I collected over a period of, oh, I don't know, 20 years, um, optical, it, optical glass lenses and prisms for my work. But I started building up a collection because I became fascinated by them. Uh, and they were all came from, uh, some of them came from cameras, but most of them came from submarines, airplanes, um, or tanks and either had been used or hadn't been used because they were not perfect enough. And then out of these, I made sculptures or works. Um, this one was a kind of key piece because I realized that I didn't need a, a, a very large prism to create a, a, a strong effect. And that was very important because what the prisms do is they refract light. Um, and, and, and what does that mean? That means that they're sending us one frequency, just one frequency. They, they actually send out all the frequencies. I mean, they send out the whole spectrum. But you, in your retina, only see one. So here we're seeing red. There we're seeing blue. That's simply because our, 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 our eye, can, is, is the retina is so small 
that it will only embrace, if you like, it will only catch that one frequency will enter into your eye. And that light actually is enormously enlightening. Uh, um, in fact, that's how I started working with prisms. Uh, I, I went to get some lenses in Paris. This was in the 60s, about 64, 65. And I had had a quarrel with my boyfriend at the time, so I was kind of depressed. Uh, but I decided I was going to get those lenses anyway. Um, and so I, I went to this shop I knew that sold secondhand optics. And I, I, it was on a very, very large boulevard. And as I crossed the boulevard, um, this brilliant uh, color completely filled my retina. And so I saw, I don't remember whether it was blue or green or red, but it was totally, totally full of light. And at that moment, I felt an enormous surge of joy, of happiness. And the, the fact that I'd been depressed a minute ago a moment before vanished. And I realized that this, well, first I didn't know what had caused that. And so I walked across the street to find out. And as I looked in the window, I realized, I sort of followed the light to the source of it. And I realized it was the prism. I, I hadn't realized that before. And so when I saw that prism, I knew I had to work with this because I wanted to give other people the same uh, energizing, uh, experience that I had. And then this, after I'd made uh, In the Valley of Darkness, I started, I had really, as you can see, was a kind of dark piece, basically a piece about where the, the, the feeling of war, of these instruments of war, entered into me and I started thinking about war. I was thinking about this sort of enormously destructive capacity that human beings have. And at that point I felt I needed some kind of therapy because I was quite depressed by it. And I started working with clay. And I started making clay stones. And I started thinking I'm going to put these clay stones together with the prisms. But of course, when I tried to bake the stones, they all exploded because I had made them solid. Um, and so I realized, why not just use natural stones? And uh, at that time, just literally when I was thinking of going to get natural stones, a friend of mine brought me a whole lot of natural stones from uh, Cornwall. And they were round, and they had a wonderful shape. And I started thinking of using them with the prisms. And it was like putting something that is completely artificial, man-made instrument, and merging it, or giving, uh, offering up, if you like, offering it to stones, which are made by time, which are made by a relationship between uh, elements, if you like, water, water and, sand and, and uh, rock, earth. So uh, you have something that's been engendered by time, developed by time, another thing which has been developed by man for a particular use. And can they come together? And they could. And they, in a sense, almost produced a third, a third element, a kind of creature. But at the same time, they were, they were landscapes. So that takes me back to Space Science Laboratory, and my collaboration with John Valerga, who was an astronomer, who came uh, to speak to me after the first seminar that I gave there, and said, uh, you know, I think I've looked at your work, and I think I have something that might interest you. And this idea of his was a technical idea of tracking the sun and being able to reflect it uh, very precisely where one wants to. In other words, he could, he could track the sun and then reflect it at any coordinates that we were given. And I thought, well, this is a great idea. And we started talking about how to use it. And California, particularly 
uh, Northern California has these great hills. You know, and they, they have this sort of, they're like ancient hills. They're very soft, they're very rounded. And I thought, well, that would be a wonderful thing to do, to put these solar reflections, reflectors, if you like, or refractors, uh, which we then, once we started making them, decided to call them spectroheliostats, on the outline, on the horizon, and to describe uh, the curvature of the landscape uh, with these points of light. In a sense, it's almost like a necklace of light, or stars, or sun, because that's what it is, it's a reflection of the sun. So when we first began to do it, <coughs> so there you see, there's John, that's my team, Pat, uh, Jason, and John, all astro astronomers, astrophysicists, <laughs> and with them we've developed this instrument uh, the spectroheliostat, which is quite small, but very powerful, and of course depends on a, a computer and a software program, which Pat wrote. And with that, we can project about, well, we can, we've done up to 20 kilometers, so 15 miles, and you still see the light, very bright. But at three kilometers, it's just amazing, because you almost think you're looking at the sun. And in fact, people do think they're looking at the sun. But, whoops, it, do, it doesn't photograph. <laughs> because what the eye sees, the camera sees in a completely different way. And so what you're seeing there, those very small dots, and when you actually see them with your naked eye, they, they fill your retina. And so they look very, very bright. Uh, and, what, and you can see also that they reflect off water, which was a surprise for John, but not for me, oddly enough, and he's the scientist. I knew that we were going to reflect over water. He said, no, no, that can't happen. And in fact, they did. So we had these great lines of light across uh, this, the Golden Gate uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and these were tests that we did. And we're still at the stage of testing, and we've been working on it for five years. We now have five spectroheliostats, and with these, we can do a kind of dance of light, if you like, because we can time them. We change their color by changing the angle. And uh, so we can project to any coordinate uh, within, within a certain angle uh, dictated by the sun. And because we're always projecting back towards the sun. The sun has to hit the, 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 the um, prisms and then refract off them and back, and it always goes back within a certain radius or arc. Um, so this is a major project which needs major funding, and as you know, it's very difficult to get. And we're still working on that, and hope that within the next year we'll create our first launch of this uh, exciting project. I'm going back again to the Mead and showing you some columns which are at the Hatton. One of them, the large horizontal one, is at the Hatton. Um, so you can see a few more. Um, these, these pieces, very much like the cones, are again about relation, but they're, they're interesting in that they're about, they're about a kind of transformation a transformation of form, how, how we see form. Because we see, it, um, we see it usually in three dimensions. But if you add the dimension of time, in other words, you rotate a cylinder so that, so that you've added that dimension of time, of something moving in time, um, you then or at least I discovered this way of seeing it, hold on, I'll show you, where you then see it on a line of light. And as that line of light, the, the, the column spins, and you start seeing every change that I've made on the column, on that line of light, as oscillations, as changes. You could say that they're changes in frequency, because 
we're talking about the frequency of the marks that I've made. And that frequency, how, how often, how many times, how many marks there are, let's say, in five inches or six inches uh, on the diameter, on the circumference of the cylinder, uh, will give you a different rhythm, a different beat, a different sort of, uh, yes, a different rhythm um, of that line. That line will change its velocity or its rhythm. Quite difficult to explain this. It's quite technical. And at the same time, when you look at it, it's just basically a flow, a flow, uh, an oscillating flow of light. And it's a phenomenon that you can see on water, on cars moving on a street. You'll see the form of a car change just through a line of light reflected off its surface. Uh, this is a large piece that I made um, called the Circle of Light uh, for uh, Central Milton Keynes. Uh, and there are 23 columns here hanging from the ceiling, all turning and changing their speed over the course of a day. And so what you get is this, it's a, it's a curved plane, so you get this rippling, rippling form that becomes like, like, um, like a flow of light. It, it no longer is a, an object or a, a structure. It actually can become, when properly lit, a, 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 fl a flux, a kind of phenomena in space. That's a Clothier lab, which, uh, oddly enough, in order to make these large columns, I have to wind copper around a um, metal cylinder that I've altered. And uh, I, I had a commission at the time to do a, 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 a very large diameter one, which I couldn't wind. And so, uh, because my partner was working also in the electrical industry, uh, we, we got to go to Parsons. And curiously enough, when I first got the NARIC residency, uh, I realized that they had actually bought this lab from Parsons. And so I went to visit it again here in, near Blythe. And so this is what it looks like. And what I found so interesting is the relationship between these places, these industrial, sci 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 industrial scientific, if you like, technological, uh, centers and the work that I've been doing. And also, not only the work that I've been doing, but the feeling I got from these places as being a source of archetypes, of mythological archetypes, a new, the new locus for mythology, for a kind of mythology of our time. Firstly, the scale of the places. The, the sense of grandeur, the sense of power uh, that you get, and the mystery, the intrigue, the secrecy, because in fact, I mean, Narek, if you like, is secret. I mean, you can't, yeah, I, as, as a resident artist, I wasn't able to, 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 to witness many of the things they were doing. Um, because these things are secret, because there's a huge amount of competition, and uh, they do not want people to know what they're doing. I'm going to go past this and just briefly um, show you some of these pieces, uh, which are rooted in mythology, which, if you like, is a kind of history of human un the human unconscious. That's what I think. It's a, it's a mixture between a history of a, a real history. A, and the un, a, history, a pre writing history, a pre literate history, but also it's a history of the human unconscious because it's full of the archetypes that inhabit our unconscious. And the less mythology we have, the more impoverished our unconscious becomes. The more impoverished our unconscious becomes, the less imaginative capacity we will have as a culture, as human beings. So it is quite dangerous, that. And I think very important for us to realize that we need to have these archetypes po populating our world. Now, I think they inhabit our 
military industrial complex. And why do I think that? Because I used elements from the military and because I've constantly worked with industrial processes. And I think that in that, those worlds, there are riches, cultural riches, that have yet to be explored. So these pieces that I've made are dramas, and they connect past with future. So they are, in a sense, uh, the reason for my title of future memory. They are memories of archetypes of the past, like the uh, Lady of the Wild Things, there, the Lady of the Wild Things, which exi she exists as a goddess in many, many cultures. Um, and she's the goddess who protects all wild animals and plants. I think plants, too. Uh, and then here, this dark shadow on the right is the woman of war. They're both female, by the way. And the woman of war is, if you like, a kind of masculinized female. And, and she is uh, an archetype of our time, and perhaps even of the future. Since much of my work has always been about 20 to 30 years ahead, and I hate the word ahead because it, it, it implies a judgment, but just out of the present, if you like. Um, here, here are these two sculptures in a, in a, in a church. Uh, where Du Stern wanted to photograph them and did photograph them um, in London. And um, the, pr the priest actually said it was, the, he'd never seen the church so alive. I, I thought that was really interesting considering that it was, uh, in a sense, a completely pagan ceremony. I was uh, creating inside his church and using all his candles and smoke to create a kind, to, in a kind of disguised the church because I didn't like the, the religious atmosphere. <laughs> so here you see the woman of war opening her wings and inside she has these warning colors, you know, the colors of danger, red, black, yellow, uh, similar to a hornet if you like. So these are not anthropomorphic figures, they're figures that um, include all aspects of life. At least I'd like them to. And even unnatural, in other words, the, the things that we make, which I think are in a sense part of nature since we make them. And they're active. They're uh, communicating with each other through both sound and light, uh, with voice and with laser. And uh, the voice activate the voice of uh, the woman of war, which is my voice, singing. Um, the Woman of War song, uh, activates about 240 uh, LEDs across the wings uh, of the Lady of the Wild Things. And the two sculptures enact the song from which I built the sculpture. In other words, the song came first. The sculpture, the sculpture was born from song. I like to think of that. In 1988, I made the first bride, again, uh, an archetypal figure, a bride in a cage, not meant to refer to, you know, marriage being a prison, by the way, <laughs> but thinking of the bride as the archetype of um, the marriage, if you like, of heaven and hell, the marriage of a kind of Persephone, uh, Inanna, descent to the underworld, which became much more apparent. Here it was unconscious. I wasn't sure what I was doing. I was deeply moved by the whole feeling of the bride. I didn't know why, because I'm, I, I'm not interested in marriage. I don't, I, I'm not married. I don't want to be married. I'm not interested in it. So it's nothing to do with the idea, the normal idea of marriage but it's more to do with the mythic idea of marriage. Like, I can see I'm going over my time. So I, I just show you these. This is the electric bride. And these sculptures are part of a series of mythic works, 